Uh, can we have, sorry, can we have monitors? Uh, I, I, I'm looking at the um, commercials right now. Can we switch those? There we go. Okay. Are we rolling? Can we start? Uh, hold on one second. Let you get that. This is a Three, two. Joining us now is one of the wealthiest, most successful, most influential, and most interesting people in all of Southern California, Patrick Soon Xiong, new owner of the LA Times, one of the top cancer scientists in the world, a co-owner of the Lakers, and that's just in his spare time. <laughs> he joins us now. Welcome to The Issue Is. Thank you for having me. Um, so you're doing all these different projects, but let's begin by talking about the LA Times. You're uh, about 100 days in, a little bit more than that at this point. Uh, we know that you've moved the facility from downtown LA to El Segundo, but for the the average reader out there, what is the difference in the times? What is the difference that they are seeing already and that they're going to see now that you're in charge? Well, one of the first things we've done, not only moved, but we've actually started recruiting some of the best talent, which is very exciting. There was great talent there, but we've now recruited some of the best talent. Sewell Chan just joined from New York Times. Uh, we have amazing new sports editorial people, and we're going to bring people food and arts and culture. I think the biggest idea is for us to bring talent and get the best journalism and get really interest for the, for the, for the average reader and for the informed reader today. And is part of that more local coverage? Both local, national and international. Look, I think uh, we first need to own California. We need to actually understand not only Los Angeles and California, which is the window to the future. And from there on, you know, we'll, we'll take on the, the rest of, the, of the, both Asia, Mexico, Canada. And what we're looking at now is, is uh, the new facility uh, that's being built in, in El Segundo. So uh, talk to us about, some people might say, it's kind of crazy right now to get into the newspaper business. They see it as a dying business. I know you think that there's a lot of space for innovation. Where do you see journalism going? Look, without journalism, we're not a democracy. I really feel that strongly about it. I came from apartheid South Africa. We really need to have an institution that actually is not just a check and balance, but an informed, truthful um, voice on behalf of the people. So you're right, it is a tough time because of what you call a newspaper. But at the end of the day, we storytellers of truth. And if we could then find not just a paper distribution, but a podcast, a video, a short form, live streaming, over the top networks like we're doing even here. So I think of us as Los, you know, the Los Angeles Times Media Group more than a newspaper. And you're also doing some work with esports and see that that could be a, a, a tie into journalism? How does that work? Because that's where the millennials are, right? And that's where the intention span is. Uh, the opportunity to, to look at this, you th I think of esports as chess when you think about it, or golf, it's not uh, a video game, it's, a, it's a, a, a sport of skill. And if their viewership, which is tens of millions, sometimes a hundred million, watch a game, it's crazy that we don't go there to try and interact and engage. Yeah, a lot of the older generation might not realize that there are people that literally watch other people play video games and like it's a sport, like you're saying, like it's football or something else. Um, so uh, you uh, have described uh, the fake news as a cancer on society. Um, uh, I think we have a, a full screen of what you've said. You say, fake news is the cancer of our time and social media is a form of metastasis. News, we need to change that. But you're not only attacking the cancer that is fake news, you're also attacking cancer itself. <laughs> you're one of the top researchers on that. That's a pretty complicated issue. Can you explain in a real basic way the work that you're doing on cancer and how it can help people out there that are watching? Well, this is the challenge that I've been fighting with 25 years of my life, that as a biologist, a scientist, an engineer, uh, that sadly, I believe, we've been treating cancer wrongly, uh, and that the idea is we've got to trick the tumor. So my first invention, which is called Abraxane, I invented a protein nanoparticle to feed the tumor, feed the tumor a drug called Paclitaxel, like rat poison, and kill it. That drug now got approved for breast cancer, lung cancer, and pancreatic cancer. But that wasn't enough. I believe that you and I have an immune system that protects us today from cancer. And it's crazy, therefore, for us to wipe out the immune system of a patient with cancer. Mm. Now, that doesn't sound logical. 
So we've been working very diligently to activate your own immune system in the process while you have cancer and let your immune system get reactivated and find the tumor. And so what's the status of that? The status of that, believe it or not, we are in late stage clinical trials. Um, and this, in November, I'll be presenting for the first time the data for bladder cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, triple negative breast cancer, head and neck cancer. The other amazing thing we've discovered that this immune system of ours doesn't care what kind of cancer it is. When, if you have a staph infection or a TB infection, your immune system doesn't figure out, is this a staph I have to go after, or mm. TB, it, it activates. So there's a thing called, the way I try to describe cancer now, is the cancer has found a way to hide and to suppress the killing cells. So it's a game of hide and seek. Mm. So it's hide me, find me, kill me. So my job, or our job, is to unblock the hiding signals, allow the body to find you and kill it. So it's literally, truly a little bit like a video game of a hide and seek against this hijacker of your immune system. What we must not do, and this is what I've been fighting against, and I get it, it's controversial when it comes to my colleagues, we cannot and should not be giving high dose chemotherapy. We cannot and should not be giving high dose radiation. Yeah. I believe that is in fact a fundamental cause of wiping out the rest of the immune system and maybe inadvertently, sadly, making it worse mm. than what it is. Wouldn't well, it be interesting if years later we look at that and think, oh my God, what were we doing? Like you look at some bloodletting or other things from other eras that, that maybe exactly. you look back with suspicion. Okay, well, like if curing cancer wasn't enough, <laughs> you're also trying to work on some of the world's energy problems. And uh, you just had recently a major announcement when it comes to zinc air batteries. What does that really mean? And how does that help people? Again, it's the same theme. I'm using the human biology. God gave us this, what you and I are walking around. This is the most complex machines. You and I actually have zinc as the machine that's actually driving the cells. A child cannot be born in prenatal without zinc. Zinc is needed for insulin. So when we looked at zinc, zinc is what Edison literally a hundred years ago tried to make as a rechargeable battery mm. and failed. So if in fact you can actually break the code and figure out how zinc works and you just use oxygen and the sun and zinc, complete nature, and make it rechargeable, you will have actually broken the code and zinc then becomes the next lithium. I believe lithium sadly is not only dangerous, it's filled with cobalt, you need cobalt. And so we, if we can break this $100 per kilowatt hour barrier, which we announced yesterday, we could potentially change the energy profile of carbon and hydrocarbons in the country. So you found a way to make zinc air batteries cheaper, uh, which means it could really help people, especially in third world countries, right? Correct. Uh, and essentially help power them in places where they don't have power right now. Correct. That's very exciting. Um, now that's the big world problems, but the thing right. that most people in LA really care about is the Lakers, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're also a co-owner of the Lakers. October and you're 20th. bringing LeBron back, right? right? LeBron is here, we've seen him, uh, now uh, playing for the team, he looks great in the jersey. Uh, you've hung out with him, he's come and played basketball at your house. Uh, how does uh, LeBron change the equation? What do you make of, of LeBron being here? Well, as I said the last time we talked, right, I think LeBron will definitely change his franchise. He doesn't need to prove anything. He's, he is he's a world-class player. He's going to bring not only maturity but strength and, uh, to the younger players that we have. And next year uh, when we have our cap all freed, um, Genie and Magic will do the magic again. And I think um, this franchise is really on the upswing. So are we going to get Kevin Durant? Are we going to get Kevin Durant? Are we going to get Clay Thompson? Are we going to get Kawhi Leonard? What are, what's going to happen next year? I don't want to get into trouble, so I'll say. We're, we're <laughs> You're thinking big because you, you don't think small. It sounds like. But and by the way, so he comes and plays basketball at your house. How does your shot compare to LeBron's? Not even. <laughs> close. <laughs> Not close. Okay. We do something on this show called Personal Issues, where we get to know you a little bit better. We've talked big issues, uh, but now we want to talk sort of a little bit more about you. So we're going to put 30 seconds on our clock, and uh, here we go. Um, we're going to ask you about your favorite book. 
Well, sadly, it's not something that many people read, but it's The Hunt for the, for the Virus, which is a, is a medical book. So. Okay. <laughs> First concert you've ever went to? Actually, the um, uh, Bird Back Rex, one of these. All right. <laughs> uh, favorite meal? Mainly wonton soup. Okay. <laughs> favorite movie? Boy, that's a hard one. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nicely said. And last question, one piece of advice to everybody out there about being successful. Well, I think truly when I say, come, you know, follow your passion, and I know this sounds trite, do the right thing. Just simple life. Just do the right thing. Figure out what is the right thing to do. Um, and following your passion, doing the right thing, really brings you, I believe, success. Well, um, one way I think you've really done the right thing is bringing LeBron back to the Lakers. And you know, the song that plays whenever Le the Lakers win is Randy Newman's I Love L.A. So as we end this segment, we got a little I Love L.A. to celebrate all the future Lakers win, thanks to you. Uh, and thanks for all the work you've done. Really appreciate you're it. You're welcome. But by the way, genie and magic bought LeBron, but I didn't do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. You're just ending cancer. Uh, so we'll take credit for that. <laughs> and also hopefully saving journalism. <laughs> Patrick well, Sinchong. Thank you, Evan. Back with more of The Issue Is right after this. Like this song? Uh, this is I Love Ellie? Yeah. Here it comes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's especially when you win. It's wonderful. Right.